Cancellous conference. Day two took one. It's looking David Welbury, you know, a terrible yeah, shame. Yeah. <laughs> there's, been a, there's been a lot of uh, injuries at the conference. Yeah. People whose uh, flights were canceled and had to spend nights in airport hotels yeah, were the lucky ones. Yeah. <laughs> Is Michael still going to be out for the whole thing? He doesn't he's know, he's still in pain. Yeah, I know. He's, two days ago, he said, yeah, well, not sure if I'm going to do that. Kind of. Yeah. 
Um, okay. Um, my first announcement is um, that I am not David Welbury. Um, he's um, fallen ill with a bad case of the flu, so uh, you're getting a, a less than excellent. Um, you're getting a less excellent moderator, but it will be me. Um, and our speaker today, um, who still seems to be flourishing, thank God, is uh, Karen Gorodaisky from Auburn U- University. Um, uh, she's given us two papers. Uh, her introduction will mostly be a discussion of her papers. Um, she's given us two papers, one which is a background paper, a background reading called Matter of Form, Kant on the Judgment of Beauty, which... Um, as I understand it, you're welcome to ask your questions about as well if you want. But the primary text, the one you were expected to read, and um, which will probably be the focus of our discussion, though you never know with this group, is um, <laughs> this might be a discussion about sellers. <laughs> it's sellers really, aesthetics, yeah, right? that would be a good one. Right. But, but Michael Williams can't start talking about sellers just yet. Um, um, and the second paper, uh, the main paper is titled Aesthetic Pleasure as an Exercise of Rational Agency. Would you like to say some introductory remarks before we start? Just a few words first to apologize that this paper also doesn't um, doesn't include anything about sellers' aesthetics. Um, and, um, uh, but I, I, I would be happy to hear that it is um, insightful in this regard. Um, and um, I'm not going to say anything about a pleasure paper. You have all read it, I assume, and we are going to talk about it, I hope, in the next two hours. So just... Uh, maybe just a few words uh, about um, a few words explaining why I burdened you with the possibility of reading two papers, not only one. So um, um, let me say that I see the pleasure paper as one of the implications of the matter of form. So it's a draft of a chapter in a manuscript. Um, 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 which um, which uh, um, develops the main argument in the other paper in the matter of form. Um, I thought first to focus on the matter of form partly because I think it's maybe be- better related to other papers here, but I decided that I need more help on the pleasure paper. Uh, it's still a work in progress, and that's why I signed it. Um, I see it as one of the implications of matter of form in so far as I see it as the view of pleasure that comes out of thinking about aesthetic judgment as differing in form from theoretical judgment and practical judgment. So the main argument of the matter of form paper is that we can't really understand aesthetic appreciation in general. We definitely can understand Kant unless we see that aesthetic judgment has a different logical form, different from the logical form of um, theoretical judgment. And uh, practical judgment, I um, explained the notion of logical form that is at stake in this paper. Um, um, I explained that it is considered logical form from a transcendental point of view. I explain it, I think, in ways that uh, echo um, Stephen Angstrom's way of explaining form in the paper we discussed yesterday. So form here is taken to be a manner of relating to objects, and it's understood through um, uh, a judgment or a presentation, specific kind of unity, specific kind of self-consciousness, <coughs> and characteristic activity. And I go on in that paper to show how the specific unity of aesthetic judgment differs from the unity of theoretical judgment in a way that suggests that the differences between them are not simply differences in content as if one is simply about beauty and the other one is not about beauty but really a difference, a logical difference, a difference in form. And I explained there are two why the differences are not epistemological. It's not simply that only aesthetic judgment can give us access to beauty. Uh, we can make theoretical judgments about beauty too. So the difference between the two kinds of judgments is really not simply epistemological, but um, logical. Um, so that's 
very, very, very briefly um, the background for that paper, and I'm happy to talk about that too during the discussion. I should say we organizers are very grateful to you, Karen. I'm just looking around the room to make sure I can get away with this remark. Because um, the Frankie um, funds interdisciplinary conferences, and um, they also provide us with a space. And Con and Sellers didn't actually look as interdisciplinary to them as it did to us. And, um, <laughs> and we were really pleased with the title of your paper because it's the one thing in the program that suggests that we were reaching beyond our discipline. Um, so questions for uh, Karen? Carl, start us off. Uh, forgive me for just interloping here, but uh, it was a pleasure to read your papers, and I think I think they're very slars in and excellent, but I uh, just want to press you on an old hobby horse. I'm looking at page 25 of, um, of, of the, the, aesthetic of pleasure the, of the, uh, yeah, the official paper, I think, of the Slate Pleasure is the exercise of national agency, and uh, I like the uh, paragraph in 25, which concludes about the importance of the consciousness of propriety and aptness, um, which is a theme uh, that seems appropriate. Uh, and then you repeat what a lot of people say uh, in the next paragraph. This does not render aesthetic pleasure a cognitive act in the Kantian sense of cognitive. And you've got the quotes there. This is in the bottom of my 25 at least. Time. It's near your footnote 36. Uh, and then you have a nice quote from the metaphysic Dona. Pleasure is a basic property which cannot be reduced to anything. This not also to the fact that cognition. So... Uh, just with that reminder, uh, <laughs> my question is whether even aesthetic judgment, aesthetic pleasure, might not be not just an exercise of rational agency, but even more broadly uh, objective and conceptual <laughs> than you explicitly say, uh, because uh, it's basically, uh, especially given your distinction between two, two kinds of judgments of beauty, uh, uh, the one you're talking about is basically a perceptual judgment, which is always going to have a sensation factor in it. And therefore, in one sense, you know, it can never be reduced to a faculty of mere cognition, which doesn't directly refer to sensations as such. I think that's what Kant's got in mind uh, at first when he says uh, there's that whole sensory side of us that can't be reduced to the, to the faculty of cognition. But that uh, is compatible with saying that, you know, everything the judgment is about is something that in maybe not in the Kantian sense of the term cognitive, but in the 21st century sense of the term cognitive, um, could allow us to say that even uh, your, your understanding of uh, aesthetic judgments, insofar as they involve propriety and aptness, involve a lot of conceptual and objective and cognitive claims. And I was just hoping you'd wonder if you explicitly agree with that, or you still want to find a, uh, something wrong about using that kind of language. Good, thank you. Um, Yes, I wouldn't want to <coughs> subscribe to this reading of Kant. So I do think that um, aesthetic judgment on Kant's view um, is rational through and through, and it does involve notions of merit and desert um, and the idea of propriety. Um, I think that it is grounded in responsiveness to reasons, specific kind of reasons that I'm trying to spell out here. Um, but I think it would be wrong to call it objective or to call it cognitive, even in the Kantian sense. So I think it's crucial to see in what ways it is subjective. Um, and I think Kant is right at the end of the day to call it subjective. That doesn't mean, so the subjective here we need to remember, um, subjective does not mean that the judgment is not about the beauty of objects. That's not what Kant means, and he repeats quite many times that it is a judgment about the quality of the object. It just doesn't determine the specific property of the object. It determines the subject. Um, it's also not subjective in the sense of having a private validity. That's how Kant distinguishes between judgments of taste and judgments of the agreeable. The judgments of taste are not subjective in the sense that they can be modified by the expression to me. So they are not true only of me, they are not grounded in any kind of private state of mind. So, so in that sense it's not subjective, for sure. Um, 
But it is subjective insofar as the determining ground of aesthetic judgment is importantly not sensation, but a feeling of aesthetic pleasure, the feeling the, the pleasure in the beautiful that Kant wants to sharply distinguish from sensation. And that means that um, the act of making aesthetic judgment, in contrast to the act of making either theoretical judgment or practical judgment, essentially involves feeling. So judgments of taste are made in and through feeling. So feeling here is constitutive of the act of making aesthetic judgment in a way that they are not constitutive of practical judgment or theoretical judgment, even perceptual judgments, even colors, of, or even judgments of colors, even judgments of qualia. Um, so, so, so even in these judgments, I claim, um, actual direct perception need not be part of the act of making the judgment, even if perceptual judgments are grounded or are based on sensibility broadly understood. They are not based on any um, uh, direct perception of the object in the way that aesthetic judgments must be. That's one thing. I also think um, that Kant wants to say that the so-called predicative, and I, I, I insist on calling, calling it so-called predicative unity in aesthetic judgment, uh, the unity of logical subject of the judgment and, and, and the term beauty um, is a unity of a representation and a feeling at the end of the day and he wants to insist on that so what's unified is the feeling of the subject with the representation of the object so that's another reason to call it subjective so again so feeling is part and parcel of that unity too um, and I also think that at the end of the day, he takes the unity of the singular representations in the judgment to be significantly different from the representations of the objects of either practical judgment or theoretical judgment. Um, and they are different in such a way that renders them in his terms, non-cognitive or non-conceptual. Um, they don't determine the object in the same way, partly because because they have a, 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 um, a different structure, I want to say. Let's say a holistic judgment rather than a compositional and general structure. Um, that is the structure of, of concepts very broadly. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, that's partly why I want to insist that Kant is right to regard it as subjective if we understand subjective in the right way. I was just hoping you have objective subjective together because a lot of objective judgments involve subjective components, especially sensory perceptual judgments. Um, and, uh, and also... Um, 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 I think your position ultimately goes back to maybe a different way you read paragraph 9 there as you discuss in the footnote uh, because uh, you can say the determination rests on pleasure or you can say as paragraph 9 seems to suggest that the determination rests on judgment which then issues in pleasure which would be more compatible with the um, parallel argument of the second critique mm -hmm. um, so I'm still searching for those those contents will tell me exactly why we can't call it subjective objective as opposed to just as people tend to say, well, it's really subjective and so forth. It seems like the objective components are built right into the notion of perceptual judgment in general and aesthetic judgment, especially about beauty, mm -hmm. inevitably anyway, but I'm just trying to push you there a little. But yeah. to go beyond what he sometimes explicitly says, where I know he says it's subjective. Yeah. So just, I mean, one, one more thing maybe about before before we even start talking about section 9, uh, about the differences between theoretical perceptual judgments and aesthetic judgments, at least on Kant's account. Um, so it might be true that a perceptual mental state is part and parcel of the content of theoretical 
practical judgment. But as symmetry with regard to testimony, for example, in the case of perceptual judgments and in the case of aesthetic judgments, suggests that these perceptual states are not part and parcel of the act of making a theoretical judgment, even a perceptual judgment might be part of the content, might be part of the enabling condition, because we have to be equipped with the um, right kind of perceptual apparatus, um, but it's not part of the act of making the judgment. According to Kant, a feeling of pleasure has to be part of the act of making aesthetic judgment, otherwise it's not a, an aesthetic judgment, it's a theoretical judgment. You might claim, you know, that the example I give that the Tree of Life is a beautiful film on the basis of, of a review by A. O. Scott that you read or anyone else or any other reliable critic that you really love. This will be a theoretical judgment. That will be your expre- the expression of your belief that a film is beautiful. On Kant's account, it fails to be an aesthetic judgment. It fails to meet one of the constitutive conditions on what counts as aesthetic judgment. Um, and I can go on to explain why, I mean, there are a few reasons, but partly it's because beauty makes certain claims on us, which are different from the claims of, let's say, good and um, the good and the truth. And so being responsive to, to, to beauty requires not simply that we express the belief that the object is beautiful, but as Kant says, um, feel for it the pleasure that everyone has to feel for it. That's the last point, because I like your example, but I would say we can make a similar distinction between indirect judgments about, say, the redness or blueness or whatever, like a review of a film, and direct perceptual senses that it looks red to me or it looks blue to me or whatever. And there, the aesthetic judgment and what I would call, in our sense, a broadly cognitive and conceptual judgment that the table is brown or whatever on the same plane, but we'll stop. <laughs> okay, so maybe it would be helpful for me to clear a sense of what are fingers and what are hands. That's, that looks like a finger. That's a finger. You know, did you a hand. That's a hand. And Steve, it was a finger. It's a finger. And then st- these two, the three fingers in this order are Johannes, Steve, and Mark, and then we'll come to you, Mark. Okay, well, I would like to, to pick up, of course, on, on, on Carl's um, suggestion about subjectivity here. And um, I am with you that um, Kant insists that it is subjective, but I'm not sure about your reasons for it. So a way of, of reading him here would be that he is, especially in the introduction, very careful to distinguish between um, the use of the representation for a cognition and the mere sort of concentration of, on the representation of the object. And um, one could put this by saying um, he's not necessarily talking about the object as an object of potential um, knowledge or cognition, but um, it's in aesthetic judgment we are simply um, concentrating or um, interested in um, the form of the representation of the object that is his wording for it. And so um, directly um, from there in the introduction, he says, okay, since we are not interested in cognition, but merely in the representation as a representation of the object, which has a certain form, um, the whole um, aesthetic judgment um, is becoming subjective, because there's nothing we are, uh, in a way, not relating in the right way to the object in the case of aesthetic judgment. So, um, my my question, my first question would be, um, or the, the biggest question would be, how does this relate to your um, explanation of subjectivity? Since I understood it that one reason why you sort of um, uh, said okay, it cannot be subjective for blah 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 reasons was um, it cannot be um, subjective in the sense of not being about the object. But it seems that in the, in the introduction he offers a reading of the aesthetic judgment not being about the object, but about the, the representation of the object, or even the form of the representation of the object. So that would, in a way, do the trick without 
referring to the more complicated suggestion I took you to make, and so I would. Maybe this sort of coincides, but I don't see it now, so I'd like to hear. Yeah, good, thank you. Um, yes, I'm very careful not to um, <coughs> ascribe to Kant the view that aesthetic judgment has nothing to do with the object. I think that the responsiveness is a responsiveness to the object in so far as it corresponds to our mind in a certain way, to our mental capacity. So, so, so to claim that a set of judgment does not determine any property of the object is partly to claim that it is never made sort of independently of our own capacities, not independently of any private space that you or, or I might feel, but independently of our kind of mindedness um, uh, in general. Um, and, you know, there are, cl there, there are claims like the one you mentioned from the introduction, um, um, in, the introduc in the two introductions mm -hmm. and in the critique of judgment as well, mm -hmm. that seem to suggest that somehow other aesthetic judgment is, completely discon is almost completely disconnected from the object. There are other um, quotes, um, other passages. Um, there are at least as numerous, I think, in which he insists that um, aesthetic judgment is still a judgment about the object. And he actually he used this claim I think in the same passage that you are quoting from the first introduction, the unpublished in introduction. No, this was the second. It was the published introduction. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but in the, in the first introduction, mm -hmm. for example, it says it's still about the object, but it doesn't determine any property of the object, for example. So, that's something that is <coughs> important for me to mm -hmm. um, emphasize. Mm -hmm. That's maybe why I need to um, develop a more complex, maybe more subtle, mm -hmm. um, account of the role of subjectivity there, what mm -hmm. still makes it subjective. Mm -hmm. So I think that it is really crucial that aesthetic judgment does not aim at cognition, mm -hmm. does not result in mm -hmm. cognition. Um, uh, I think that's... But, I mean, one, one, one should be probably very wrong, must be very careful to... to um, distinguish between, or to, to clarify what sense of aboutness is in question. Mm -hmm. Of course, the, um, the representation is um, about the object in any case because that's the content of this representation. And if you read aboutness here in the sense of intentional having the representation having a certain intentional content, then you have it in taking very serious the quotes I just um, related. Um, uh, already in uh, in there you have this importance about objects so mm -hmm. um, that, that's why I, I do not really see that um, this is a decisive the, the text or evidence where it says well, the object is involved whatever or mm -hmm. is about the object and so on is really something that should be counted against um, the subjectivity reading in, in, in my chest but this is just <coughs> It shouldn't no, account. Because uh, okay. those are about objects. You know. so, so, the representation, so the form of representation of the, of, right. of the so object help is about objects. So. so help me understand your worry. Um, so, uh, well, I, I thought that you were, you were suggesting that maybe, maybe this was actually... Um, it's a different way of involvement of objects at stake here. Oh, and if you, um, in, in both suggestions, and um, I <coughs> that in your suggestion, the object is... Um, more robustly involved, as it were. And I do not see that Kant is committed to that. And if he is not committed to that, then the, there might be a less um, complicated or less demanding sense right. of um, subjectivity that is at stake here. That would be the issue. Good. So why do you think that, 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 that my reading suggest a more robust involvement of the object. That's My impression was that it is, it is related um, to, to your, um, to your um, theory about, uh, about the feeling of pleasure itself being about the object and being responsive to the object as mm -hmm. an object. Mm -hmm. And that is something I think I would like to reach. Okay. So but, in your but account, is, no, no, that, responsive that, that, to yeah. 
The form of the object in yeah. the set? Okay. The form of the representation of the object. I would take Kant very seriously. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. I, but I think I would agree. But this form, right? But this form is, I mean, it's a form of the object. Of the right? representation of the object. That's different. Okay. I mean, so, so one thing, I, I mean, I'm not sure if that goes all the way. So, I mean, I think that the, the discussion of form is really important. Mm. And I think that the representation of beautiful objects are importantly different of the representations we 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 use um, in theoretical judgments and practical judgments. I'm with it. I'm and I, agree I, with I think that I'm, course, su yeah. I'm suggesting it towards the end when I mention something about the beauty making features of the object. So I think that for Kant, this form that he usually calls the form of cohesiveness without mm. purpose. Mm. Um, is much closer to the form of another rep representation that he lists, namely the form of the idea. So it's a holistic representation, for example. It's mm -hmm. a representation mm -hmm. in which the parts and the whole are reciprocal. Mm -hmm. So you can't really mm -hmm. understand the parts of any beautiful object without actually seeing how they contribute to the beauty of the object as a whole, and you don't see the beauty of the object as a whole independently of seeing how each part exactly contributes mm. to the whole, for example. Mm. And that's partly why beautiful objects cannot really determine by concepts. Concepts have a different kind of um, structural unity or representational unity. Mm. So I think that the, the, the talk about form is very mm. important for me. I don't mm. want to undermine mm -hmm. um, that. Mm -hmm. um, mm. But again, but it's a form that, that, that relates to the features that make their objects beautiful and the way that they correspond to our minds. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that... Well, I think we, I think we should come back to that because that was more, tends to be more like a hand. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, ha you, you have preserved a hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, all right, uh, this is um, a thought that occurred to me in connection with Carl's question. Um, um, the that, that involves this paragraph here on 25 and 26. Um, and it may be now, thinking back, you, you dealt with this at some point, like I can't myself say for sure, so I thought I'd just ask. Um, um, you, um, I, I'm curious to know a bit more about how you understand um, um, the, I mean, the, the, the specific sort of reasons that figure as aesthetic reasons um, can be offered for an aesthetic judgment. Um, um, and I guess I'd, I'd like to just have a, um, a bit of a clearer sense of how you're understanding reason here or a reason for a judgment um, that um, set sets out how it is or isn't related to reason in the sense Kant will use characteristically when he you know, speaks of reason as the highest cognitive power distinguishes from the understanding and judgment. Um, I'm just thinking of the way in which aesthetic judgments in the, uh, of beauty um, in the first instance seem to involve the faculties of understanding, evidently not reason um, and imagination um, without any concepts involved. Um, when you think, when, when you speak of aesthetic reasons, do you have in mind reasons that we give, and even in the case of such judgments, um, where there are no concepts um, in, in play, according to the account as it's at least presented in some of the passages? Um, I'm thinking of the pure judgments of beauty as opposed to the impure, that, that, that very prim that the primordial case. Um, could you could you say a bit about what? what um, an aesthetic reason, how, how it's related to the faculty of reason and whether it's in play even in this primordial case. Yeah, good, great. Yeah. Let me start by saying something about aesthetic reasons and the way I think they um, differ from theoretical reasons and, and practical reasons. Um, I think I'm going to have more trouble explaining how they relate to reason um, itself rather than to the understanding 
Um, but I'm not sure that that's a problem, and I would want to hear from you more why it is a problem, because I do think uh, that theoretical uh, judgments, it? too, are responsive to certain reasons. Um, so that's that, that mm -hmm. would be. Um, um, and just like one little remark about what you said. Um, I'm also, even in the case of fewer judgments of beauty, um, I want to be very careful before I commit myself to saying that they involve no concepts at all. So they don't, they, they don't involve concepts as their determining ground. Concepts cannot justify the judgment as a judgment of beauty. But I think that, I mean, the categories are still in play, even in, 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 in judgments of pure beauty, in so far as it's judgment about, for example, a single substance. So I think the categories are in play. So just, that's I, I, yeah, I agree with that. I yeah, mean, so that's just, yeah. Yeah, just a side remark. Yeah. Um, um, so I do think that even in this case, um, I can ask you, so wh I mean, why do you think that, you know, the, the sunset is so beautiful? Mm -hmm. And you say, oh, wow, it's because of the, you know, the particular shade of purple and the way that it um, changes from purple to red. I mean, there are <coughs> aspects of the object that you are responsive to, even if you're actually incapable of articulating them. Um, and I take those to be the reasons that your aesthetic pleasure is responsive to. Um, but there are not reasons for believing that the object is beautiful. Okay? So there are not, we might say, evidential reasons. They don't give you an evidence that you can just give someone else as a basis for grounding this other person's judgment. Um, there are also not practical reasons, I want to say. There are not motivational. There are not reasons to go and see yeah. that something is beautiful. Yeah. But there are what I call reasons for appreciating. Mm -hmm. So reasons for seeing that it's beautiful and feeling pleasure for it as beautiful. So that's that's just sort of the beginning of that path. Um, um, of course, it's really important, too, that those reasons are reasons for appreciating this specific sunset, not the, not the sunset uh, of the same day in a different place, not yesterday's sunset, and not tomorrow's sunset. And in that sense, I think they are importantly different from reasons for believing and reasons for acting. Um, um, how are they related to the faculty of reason? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't think that reason, I mean, it, it seems that this one can't account when it comes to judgments of beauty, say, no judgments of the sublime. Um, reason does not play an important role. So the lawfulness comes from the interplay of the understanding and the imagination, um, and, 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 and that, I think, what explains the capacity to be responsive to anything at all, and, and to see it as lawful, as something that, that you should be responsive to. Okay, okay again, uh, that's complicated, too, because there's no sense of objective out there. Mm -hmm. um, and you're not determined, there's no determination to feel this pleasure. And you cannot um, compel anyone else to feel this pleasure unless the person actually sees right. and feels the same thing that, that, that you do. You can help that person do it. You can help the person, you know, stand. Right. Um, um, towards the sunset in sort of the, the, the best possible way to see what you see and to feel for it, what you feel. But you can't say, well, that's what the concept of beauty means, right? That's what it means to be a beautiful sunset. It's just to have this color. I mean, you can't do that. Um, 
So there is a lawfulness there. There is responsiveness to that which deserves this pleasure. And you can claim that, but you cannot explain this kind of desert in terms of any general concepts or any general principles. Uh, and in that sense, it's not related to reason, uh, I think, at least in part. Rationality without reason, like lawfulness without law. So oh, like oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, rationality without general reasons or something like that. Yeah, I think I think, I think he's pushing in this direction. I mean, otherwise, it's really hard to see why he thinks that pleasure and displeasure are entitled for a critique, why he thinks that they, they are a priori uh, and they're grounded in the, the principle of the power of judgment. I think that you know, we, we have to think that with the third critique, he, 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 the third critique is not simply a sequel to the first two critiques, but really a call for us to rethink rationality in general and to understand that you know, we can understand rationality on the model of theoretical rationality and then think that somehow practical rationality and aesthetic rationality are some kind of weird species. We need to rethink rationality in light of the similarities and differences between the three domains. Um, So it's a peculiar form of rationality, but it's peculiar partly, I think, because of our, I don't want to say prejudices, but but because of our traditional ways, very ingrained ways of thinking about rationality throughout the history of thought. Mm-hmm. Or, okay, so, so just parenthetically, I mean, I don't think theoretical rationality is the way you said it was at all. It sounds much more like what you just said, aesthetic rationality is it. I mean, I just don't think, and I, I actually have always thought there was a kind of structure that you were supposed to see that. I, I'm not going to argue about Kant with you people, but my view was always that when you read the third critique, you went back and applied it and saw that you misunderstood <laughs> all these other things. But leave that. I wanted to pick up Carl's point. About you, if I understand you, this claim that there's a difference in the subjective structure of perception and aesthetic uptake, and I, I'm not convinced. I'm also not convinced that Kant thinks it's there, but again, I won't argue about that because I don't know anything. Um, but one thing you said was that you said, well, one of the arguments is that uh, the testimonial case, I can you know, look, and, look and see that there's a cup on the table, or John can tell me there's a cup on the table, and you said those are the same act. But that just seems to be a prejudice that's clearly false. Um, just because they're expressed, can be in the right context, expressed by the same grammatical sentence, doesn't mean that, ah, a cup's on the table, whether seen as a speech act or whatever mental thing is going on, and, oh, there's a cup on the table, because John told you, are the same act. And if you want to put it in a, you know, grab it, we have a way of formulating it such that it patently isn't. Lo, a cup. You can't get entitlement to lo a cup from John, precisely. It, it, it ex- explicitly expresses the first personal receptive uptake of the act that nonetheless calls on other licenses uh, declaratival uh, consequence. So, so uh, which seems to me to be precisely the structure of the... Now, now forgetting about the, the feeling part, we can, that's a different issue, but precisely the claim is that it's only an aesthetic judgment if I receptively give uptake of the right sort to the painting. There's an actual painting on the wall that makes it easy. Uh, But when I do that, it calls on others to do the same thing. It seems to have precisely the same structure as an act of expressing an observation. You know, if I say, lo, a white cup, I'm calling on John to also look at it, recognize that it's there, not believe it on testimony. He, he can't do the same thing by believing it on testimony. So, so I don't... So, so you have this kind of... Uh, uh, well, as Rebecca and I put it, the subjectivity on the input end. It, it's essentially first personally receptive on the input end. But the normative consequences of performing the act properly are um, objective, if you want to use that word, but they're, they're asia-neutral. There's an, an enti- asia-neutral entitlement. Kind of, so I don't see anything to distinguish <coughs> perceptual receptive judgments and aesthetic judgments in this 
you know, subjective objective structure. They seem to me to be exactly the same. I always kind of thought Kant wanted us to learn that about perception from the third critique, but again, I won't, whatever, I'm not going to fight about what Kant said, but it seems to me that's true. Okay. Um, great. So, 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 let me see if I, I get your point. So you have, you, you, you're suggesting that perceptual judgments, direct, theoretical perceptual judgments, um, cannot legitimately be based on your ten- testimony independently it's not a percept. Well, there is a kind of act. It's called perceiving, and in the public world, called I, I mean, you could put a word for it, called an observative, but it, an expression of observation, mm-hmm. a low, low a rabbit kind of things, and those kinds of acts cannot be warranted by testimony. No. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, good. Why not? So now I'll go. I, I, well, I, I mean, I can't claim... Because part of what you're doing when you say low a cup yeah. is expressing that you have first personal receptive uptake okay. of the cup. And I certainly can't ex- get an entitlement to express my first personal receptive uptake of the cup from John's telling me that there's a cup there. Straightforward. So, so here is one way to see the difference. I mean, granting that that's true. This is one way to see the difference between those judgments okay. and aesthetic judgments. So, in aesthetic judgments, I mean, the point is not simply that you need to be affected in the right way by the object and so have the right perceptual object. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think, not the issue that really interests Kant. Mm-hmm. The issue is that you're simply not responsive to beauty as beauty calls for mm-hmm. unless you feel this pleasure for you. That's why I don't think the pleasure is a different, is a different issue. Okay. I don't think so. I think the thinking that it's a different issue is actually thinking about aesthetic judgment as conjunctive in some sense. Mm-hmm. Thinking that it is the expression of belief and then there is also this weird thing that is pleasure. I think that, that that's partly why I'm trying to say no, it has a different logical form. It's not yeah. just that. No, but I think these, I mean, I, I, I would quibble a little bit about calling it logical, but I, I think there's a different form to a perception, a perceptual expression versus a mere statement with the same content. And, I, and, and, and it's, it's Right, I mean, epistemologically terribly important that observing a cup is different from merely knowing that there's a cup there, partly because all of your empirical judgments have to be based upon these, and, uh, and otherwise you have nothing to say about what makes them different. If you, just, mm-hmm. if you reduce the perceptual act to judging that the fact is true, then, then the question, why should we base our knowledge on that? It, there's no answer. Mm-hmm. There's, there is an answer, and it's precisely that it is a different kind of, and, and it's, and you're not having that act. You're not, ha- you're not in that state. You're not doing that kind of uh, recognizing. You might be judging, but you're not recognizing if you're not subjecting yourself to the cup. Okay. So, it, so it seems to me that that's. I mean, I, 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 I'm not saying they're the same, but that mm-hmm. structure does seem to me to be really importantly in common between the two. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I thought the thing, just to stay on this for a minute, make sure we're discussing Rebecca's point. Um, I mean, it's clear there's a difference between being in the first-person position to, you know, have, you know, the perceptual experience and simply Mm -hmm. um, acquiring the content of perceptual experience, you know, in some third-person way. I I, I don't see anything that um, Karen said that denied that. Um, The question is whether, you know, her claim is, just now up for discussion, is how does beauty enter into these things? I mean, it's one thing to say, well, a cup, um, but um, that then involves a content which, um, importantly, can be known. <laughs> um, um, and, and, and it's crucial to knowledge also, the other side of this, that um, it can, it, it can, that same content can come up in a third personal nexus. And no, no, that no, 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 that, that's but not, she, she said to Carl that there was a difference in the subjective objective structure, but and that's what I'm just But if I say, 
as I'm often in a position to when I get up in the moment, low a blurry cup. Um, um, the low a blurry cup um, is not something um, that um, John inquires entitlement to, as it were, predicate blurry of the cup. You know, right. you know, once we just, you know, as it were, move from the first person to the third personal nexus in that way. Um, however, blurry works. You know, it's essentially tied. To, I there's mean, a report on the structure of the sensation. Yeah, there's a, well, there's a lot of we could say about it. it's a tricky thing, but um, but um, but but its content is one you're going to acquire through your own first personal access, um, and and um, and and she wants to make a claim about beauty, which is. I don't think quite. It doesn't make it quite as subjective as blurry. Uh, it's much more complicated. But she wants to make a claim about beauty, which just to get it, you know, roughly in the right environment here is one in which the claim is grounded in your. And this is the sense in which it's not just transmissible in the way. Um, oh, but, but, the, the, but the claim but, that but, there's company. But it's, it's, it's precisely not like blurry, right? I mean, it, 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 the beauty judgment can't be like a blurry judgment has no. Uh, claim on anyone else. That is a report on my. No, it, it has that difference. And beauty is not like that at, at all. Right. No. It's, it has that difference. But but I, the, the similarity it has with beauty, uh, blurry. I mean, I agree. It's you know working this out, and it's her job to do it. But the similarity <laughs> is is that it's essentially tied to one's experience. The pr- the predicate you know you know doesn't you know, make a claim about the object which can then be transmitted independently of the experience and still count as a judgment of beauty. That's what she wanted to... That was, I thought, her point about the testimony was that it's no longer... Um, but, but, well, anyway, but I, I think beauty in, in, in this regard is just like... It precisely can't... We can testimonially... I can be told that a painting I've never seen is beautiful and I can know if that's a thing I can know, but it's not a... Aesthetic judgment. I agree. Right, that's, I think that's that your that's position. Kind of exactly. I think that that's kind of And you. exactly in the same way, uh, John can know that the cup is white because I saw it, but it's not a res- it's not a report when John does it. So I, I just Again, think I don't think it's the, but I don't think different. it's the same. I mean, I okay. see where I, mean, I, I no. see where you're going. And yeah, I yeah. think okay. it's like. At least superficially, it looks the same. Just as you know, X is beautiful and X is a square. I think at the end of the day, superficially, looks the same. Okay. So it's not the same deep judgmental right. structure. Um, and 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 um, and I think that the main difference involves the explanation of why the first person. Experience, direct experience, okay, good. is that, involved that, in that, both. That might be different, and yeah. that's—I uh, think—that's mm-hmm. crucially different. No, no, I'm not. And, it's, yeah. and, and, and you can again. You know, I don't think you can separate here sort of the the, the first personal experience and the explanation. It's 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 it's, it's so part of the package basically uh, that explains why aesthetic judgment is the way it is. It's part of the constraints of making aesthetic judgment, yeah. constitutive conditions. No, I'm not. I'm not disputing the mic. Other different structures. So, so just, just about, well, maybe it's just not a, something not a good idea to invoke the testimonial case because they seem to be analogous to this respect. And that this analogy you're up to rests somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a general matter of, of strategy. Yeah. Um. I mean, I, I, I think the testimony, just the, 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 the predication of cop, you know, um, your entitlement to that. Survives the fact that we're no longer in the first personal report nexus. That's um, so. That's a disanalogy between two. Why? So does the so does so that that the, the, the judgment of the beautiful the testimony makes the point that um, uh, there isn't a counterpart in, in Mark's case. A uh, way of using the notion of judgment of Cupwood. It's right? <laughs> yes. um, uh, a counterpart to, to Kant's way of using the notion of judgment of beauty. There's no, there wouldn't be any point in saying I'm not going to call it a judgment of cuphood unless it's uh, a low, um, expressible with a low. There would be no point at all in that. Whereas mm-hmm. there's lots of point in saying um, it doesn't matter that, that, that there's some content that um, I can get from the testimony of A.O. Scott. Um, if that's not a judgment of beauty. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. 
So, so I'm going to make a procedural suggestion since we're approaching the end of the first hour. We have two more fingers on this, Thomas and David, and then I suggest we close the key on the first <laughs> hand yeah. so we can get to the other hands and thank, your, thank the people with the hands for their patience. So Thomas and David? Yeah, this is <clears throat> just a request for clarification on something that came up in, in your extent with Steve. So you both agreed that in an aesthetic judgment, the categories are in play. I think that was the locution that was used, and I would just like to know how I'm supposed to think about that. I mean, in what way they are in play? And I mean, here's a reason to think that it can't be right. Um, categories can be deployed either theoretically or practically. Practical deployment seems out of the question here, since this is not about determinations of the will. A theoretical deployment would represent... Wait, yeah. The theoretical deployment of the categories represents uh, something as an object in nature bearing natural properties um, if that were what's in play here then beauty would be a natural property which I take it is not so yeah, is there a third deployment of no I think it's a theoretical deployment but it's not it's not, a ter- it's, it's not determining the beauty of the object it enables you to make a beautiful job. I mean, unless you see a pain, I mean, unless unless the category of substance, for example, is presupposed, I want to say, you you can't even you can't say this painting is beautiful. I mean, there would be no this painting here. So just in order to even um, <coughs> guard the object that is judged to be beautiful as an object not even of a certain sort, but as an object, the categories have to be support, presupposed. And I think that, that, that I think needs to be support, presupposed if you can actually compare different statements to one another uh, or if they stand in certain kind of logical relations to one another, relationship implications, etc. So I think this is presupposed, but that has nothing to do with the, basically with the judgment of the object is beautiful. Um, that's the main thing. And and and, and, and Kant repeats it again and again that concepts cannot determine the judgment of beauty. They cannot be the determining ju- the, the determining ground of the judgment. But that doesn't mean that they play no role in the setting um, in the experience which is the back you know the background conditions of the experience. Yeah. Okay. Maybe the question is precisely what is it this? I mean, the, this is not given. You assume that this is given. A painting, you mean? Yeah. Um, so, 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 in what sense do I assume that it's given? But Just we have the, this. We, we know what we are talking about before the judgment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's presupposed, again. It's presupposed. Yeah. It's not, it's it's not denying a I'm denying this. Okay. So you think that the static judgment is determining the this basically? That's why kind of everything you say basically is an expression of this that we don't have this is before the judgment. Mm-hmm. And so what does what do what the judgment is the emergence of the this? Think of think about symphony listening to it. It's more you know it's more less obviously a, an object. I mean, if you can't aesthetically respond to a symphony, I doubt you can even identify one. Exactly. Performance and the sound. Um, good. Um, so see how, um, how that works. So I think I agree to some extent, to the extent that I think that sort of the unity of the forms of beautiful objects is a different kind of unity um, that cannot be determined exactly by concepts. I think that that's true. Um, but I think, um, but I think that some categories have to be in play even in order, I mean, to see something as colored, that's not anything that 
sort of the, 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 the free imagination and the lawful understanding can deny, can, 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 can explain independently of that, you know, the, the, the axiom uh, of the third critique. So, I mean, the, maybe there is a difference between individuation in the aesthetic case that requires exactly the, what Kant calls the free harmony of, of the faculties, um, but there are still enabling conditions that have to come from the categories okay. that cannot be supplied by the power of judgment. It seems like, uh, if I understood Rod's point, but maybe I don't, um, it's always a question with Rod's points. With it. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like the, the, the worry isn't so much about whether we can say the categories are in play at all or not, as so much a point about the order of apprehension. I mean, you were making it sound like First, we fully determine the thing as having the kind of unity of substance that it needs to be, to have in order to then, you know, in the second step, bring in the predicate beauty. So we say it's a painting, and then we say it is beautiful. So what the categories have first done is sort of supply the thing, and then in the second step, beauty comes in. Whereas Arad's thought is the nexus of the this and the beautiful come together and that could still be consistent with your thought Excellent. that you know if we have unity of experience here at some level there'll be things to say about the, this which will involve theoretical you know cognition and therefore the categories will be in play but it's, it seems like Arad's real worry wasn't about whether the categories in play or not but some picture of how in order to like get them clearly in play um, you had a certain story about the order of apprehension Excellent. yeah no so I, I misspoke if, uh, if I implied you know sort of the former that two two levels picture I don't think that that's the right picture of the page. Definitely not. Um, Seems to go against some of what we've yeah, seen. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. So I think that's what I thought. Last finger. You no, know, you and John cover <laughs> the finger. So, um, okay. Like, Sorry about that. Sorry. Matt! Oh. <laughs> Are you still here? Yeah, it's better than finger. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can't even forget it. We close the queue on the finger. Um. It could have been a finger in the sense that it could have been a follow on Steve's question. I, I, I was interested also in the sense of reason at issue in talk about aesthetic reasons. Uh, I guess not so much from a point, the point of view of Kantian systematics, but, but just, uh, I wanted to understand, or I wanted to know if you had more of a kind of systematic kind to say about in what sense these things are reasons. I mean, it is, it is a striking fact that uh, we, you know, argue about topics of aesthetic judgment, we adduce considerations, right? Uh, it's also striking, it feels right to say, I think this is a rough statement of something you say, that, that uh, somebody can make an argument about a certain object of aesthetic, potential aesthetic appreciation. I can accept that all of the considerations Produced are uh, true, and that this is this is a reasonable form of argument to be bringing to bear here. And nevertheless, I can refuse the conclusion uh, without being in it, and refuse not, not, not merely you know not, not accept it, but not be moved at all. Um, right. Uh, so there's a, it, it's hard to, I mean, you know, if, if, if a root idea of a reason is some kind of, you know, ratio of proportion between, uh, you know, the, the things that are given and some conclusion, it's, it's harder to see <coughs> relationship here. It's harder to see what the kind of proportionality is. And I wondered whether you had more thoughts about this. And the other thing, I was thinking about the tree of life, uh, you know, which... Uh, I mean, I feel ambivalent about I love Malik. I've had profound experiences. I want to defend him, you know, uh, uh, against his misunderstandings. On the other hand, a friend said to me at some point, don't the central scenes of family life look like advertisements for furniture polish? <laughs> um, and it, it nags at me, you know? And uh, so I, I, there's something I have to deal with, right, in whatever... 
But what is the relationship between that and the evaluation of the film? It, it, I mean, it, it is an aesthetic reason, I guess. You know, I mean, if you, you could call it that. But it, it looks more like it's, look at it this way, not uh, here is something in, in the light of which the conclusion uh, is proportionate. Um, Some aesthetic considerations can just be false. That might be one of them. Well, okay, look, I, right, I, I know that there's a lot of things. Right? Just, yeah. just, I mean, but, but in we general... We can next to each other and see if they still look like In general, if that's, if that's a paradigm of, 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 a, of a kind of thing that could appear in aesthetic argument, it looks like it has a different relationship to the judgment than... Reason. reason standard we do, yeah. Yeah, great, excellent. So, I mean, that's partly why I wanted to present this paper because that's what I feel, you know, I'm still trying to work out. Um, so good, yeah, I think you're completely right. I think you had in mind, you know, I give one example of two judgments of the performance. One says, wow, it was an amazing performance, so precise. The other one says, yeah, it was so precise. That's exactly why it was so like mechanical. It just was a terrible performance, right? So, 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 these argumentations, these reasons, um, it seems, are not independent of something like first-person appreciation. They are not sufficient on their own for reaching any kind of conclusion without appreciating on your own whether they actually contribute to the beauty of the work or to the ugliness of the work, basically. So I, I completely agree about that. And so why to call them reason? So I think I'm, what I'm trying to do here is sort of resist that. And I also say, you know, it's not, it's not a basis for any inference. Um, there's no, yeah, there's basically, it, it doesn't have the same kind of sort of premise and conclusion relations. Um, so I think I'm trying to resist the idea that this is the only model for reasons. Um, so I'm trying to suggest that. But why preserve? I mean, w one thing to say would be, you know, considerations can be brought to way bear in a way that does not uh, reflect an operation of reason, um, but something else. But I mean, you, you're you, in, in in wanting the term reason to span these several cases. You're, you know, I take it wanting to commit yourself to a common genus, right? And I, I, my question is about how to think about the common genus and whether, you know, there's sufficiently close connection with, you know, what's classically thought of as a, okay. a reason, reason okay. relation. Okay, excellent. So, I mean, I have a number of things to say here. Yeah, um, yeah I want a common genus, but um, I think you now I'm trying to think about. Um, the genus on, along the lines of what Anton Ford calls categorical genus. So, so, so is that the, the, the graph of the genus is not prior to the graph of the genus. <coughs> so only if we see what aesthetic reasons, classical reasons, and, and theoretical reasons are, we can mm -hmm. see what reason in general is. I think that works also in terms of um, judgment here. Um, but it doesn't mean that I don't want there to be important commonalities, commonalities that allow us to call, to regard reason as the common genus here. So I do want that. And so what I'm trying to suggest here is that there are at least two features of these aesthetic reasons that at least put some pressure on us to call them reason. Mm -hmm. One of them I explained by this you know, sort of reference to the um, normative explanatory nexus. So the idea is exactly the idea that you mentioned with your friend. I mean, you do feel that, that the friend's reasons put some pressure on you, um, that, that you can't both be wrong. Um, uh, you can both be right, I guess. Sorry. <laughs> um, um, uh, and the idea is that what explains your your specific love of the film at the end of the day is normative. You take it also to be the reasons for which your friend has to find the film great. 
and the other way around. He seems to think that, you know, his reasons for not liking it um, are reasons that you should subscribe to. So, so what, 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 what explain your specific judgment and your specific state you take to be also normative. It has some kind of normative force. These are the re- these are these are. I mean, I, I start to use a different well, I, word, I, but it's, these are the reasons that that everyone um, that that should basically shape everyone's state and everyone's judgment. That's one. Just 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 the other feature. And the other feature is the feature that I maybe completely Ill- illegitimately adopt from you. And that's the, the relationship of actuality and endorsement there. And Kant seems to suggest in making different kinds of claims, I mean, the, 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 the primary of which is the claim that aesthetic pleasure is made in and through reflection, it's the pleasure of mere judging, that the pleasure itself, that's actually feeling the pleasure, is itself a form of endorsing it as proper to its object. I want to say. So 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 the pleasure itself is a way of being already responsive to something that calls to you. Something. So it it involves self consciousness of itself as proper to the object. That's that's how I read what yeah. I'm saying there and I think that if that's true then yeah we should think about the thing we are responsive to. Okay, can I say one more thing? I mean, so, I mean, I agree with you about those features, and maybe we're partly having a semantical dispute about what to call a reason or something, but, I mean, so first principles, I take it, would have the feature that, uh, you you know, uh, my, my, uh, you know, uh, the actuality of my, you know, conviction in a first principle uh, is you know grounded in my seeing the first principle to be endorsed, but not on the basis of something else that um, uh, rationalizes it. So, so we need we need a sense of you know as it were uh, you know operation of the self-conscious power of cognition or whatever that the self-conscious power of judgment, not cognition, that that, that, um, that that is more general than the idea of uh, something done for ra- for reasons. The thing that seems to make the idea of reasons attractive is this fact that we can argue about the question. Mm-hmm. But I was just wondering, I mean, might we think of that arguing as more like to look at it this way? So, I mean, in, in the case of perception, mm-hmm. too, right, yeah. you, you can, um, you know, try to bring somebody around to your way of seeing, yeah. not necessarily by giving uh, evidences, but by saying, you know, I don't know. Good. So, I mean... I think I'm. Yeah. I mean, I see your point, and I think I'm. I'm. I'm, I'm saying at some point, you know, where, but at, at some point, I'm saying, you know, so those kinds of reasons are not given as proofs or something like that, but guidance of perception, right? So I, 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 I use this title. I think that's true. I'm still not sure that that ex- that excludes their nature as reasons. Um, that's that's. Since John's finger is particularly wiggly, <laughs> that's a thought that we should see things in terms of, um, I don't know, an invitation to look at it like this. Uh, it doesn't seem to be quite, quite being responded to here. I mean, the, 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 the shape of your response keeps sounding to me as if uh, you're, you're taking it that the things about which there's a question whether we should call them reasons or not are. Um, common ground or something. Um, uh, um, it, I mean, it strikes me as really significant so that, that, that sort of dispute about the tree of life. Um, uh, uh, I mean, it might be a dispute about whether the invitation to see it like that, um, that those scenes look like TV ads, um, uh, should, be, should be acceded to. So it isn't that there's some bunch of considerations um, um, which uh, have some kind of relevance to um, uh, the, the, the aesthetic pleasure, and the question is whether to call that kind of relevance 
um, and I, I, I thought Matt's point went deeper than, than um, uh, I mean, you, you, you shaped up to saying maybe it's just a dispute about what to call a reason um, as if uh, you know the consideration that has a, 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 a bearing on, on um, the to be felt character of the attitude um, that's, that's fixed uh, and what do we what do we call that there? Um, sorry, I'm, no, I, agree, I, I, agree, I didn't agree want you to agree, give up yeah, quite so quickly. Uh, no, I, I agree. I agree with you. I mean, I think that I mean the, the idea of reason goes with some kind of validity. I was thinking, mm-hmm. you know, of, mm-hmm. and, and the, it's characteristic of, of of this relationship between consideration, let's call it, and judgment, mm-hmm. that I can I can just wave it away. I mean. Uh, uh, um, uh, right. I mean, and that, 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 that well, I think that, that I you can refuse to see the thing. In the right way to play that game. And, and, and the, 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 to be, the, the, the thought about the to be feltness of the aesthetic pleasure um, extends, right, to the to the to be acceptedness of the thing that the friend says. I agree. That, I agree. that, that is offered as a. Yeah. Might, suggesting that you shouldn't be feeling this uh, aesthetic pleasure. I don't deny but that they can be rejected. Let me, let me just mm-hmm. put it that way. I think that is really important. Mm-hmm. That's something that Kant emphasizes. But I think that he also emphasizes that, I mean, in some sense, it's not just up to you mm-hmm. to reject it or to accept no, it. No. If you reject mm-hmm. the the right, right reasons yeah. to be to 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 yeah. to, to, to but, feel um, this interest of right. pleasure to it. Mm-hmm. It's some kind of failure on your part. So maybe it's not a conceptual failure, let's say, mm-hmm. uh, as in the theoretical case. Mm-hmm. It's not practical failure exactly. Yeah. It's not yeah. it's not your failure as a practical stuff. Mm-hmm. But it is a, pl- a failure, right. a failure to sort of to to, sure. to stand up to. Uh, that, that's the to be feltness of the pleasure. But that, that, um, I, I didn't think you were giving enough weight to the thought that. <laughs> That kind of to be and that kind of gerundive uh, applies to um, the, 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 the sorts of things that are to be said about this object on, on, on the lines of Matt's example. The, the putative reasons uh, the, all the, um, get their standing from so, what so you So I mean, feel. it isn't that it's up to you. Yes. There's, there's, there's a way of getting it right. Um, the right. friend is wrong and Matt is right. I mean, or, or <laughs> the friend is right Matt and Matt is, is wrong. wrong. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, a, an argument an issue in a, in a determination. <laughs> yeah, it's got um, nothing to do with the feasibility. Yeah. It's a, look at it this way isn't a reason. It, it, it's an orienting, an orientation of you toward the thing. I, ab- I, I think the, the, the I completely agree. Right? I, I think I completely mm-hmm. agree. That's yeah. why I, you know, wh- that's why I call aesthetic pleasure, I regard aesthetic pleasure as responsiveness to the question, what is to be felt? And I'm emphasizing, mm-hmm. as in the case of testimony, that it is, I mean, that, that you have to feel it in order to be responsive in the right way. So, I mean, I, I completely agree that, again, that sort of the, the reasons are not independent of what I call earlier appreciation or feeling. I mean, it's not simply that you can use the reasons to make your own judgment. I mean, it's, 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 it's only if you get to the point, as Kant says about the point, the, the poet, the famous poet there, that you feel the pressure of these reasons that you can make an aesthetic judgment based on that. I, I think that's completely true. I thought we were agreeing right up until the end, but the point is, this is not a reason. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I did think we're kind of flattening now. I mean, I, thought, I like the point that, you know, I mean, just to be fair here, I mean, I like the point there's, you know, something useful about the analogy between the kinds of considerations that induce in aesthetics and look at it this way. But, um, but there's, a, I mean, interesting criticism doesn't just involve 37 remarks of the form look at it this way. It does have argumentative structure in it. And that, I think, is consistent with John's point that ultimately all of this goes back to articulating a possible experience, which you have to have. But, but, it could, you, know, but you know, if someone really thinks, you know, that these things look like, you know, commercials, um, you know, for furniture polish, then you start talking what such, such commercials look like, and you describe that in some detail, and you lay it out. And then you describe this thing in some detail. And, then it, and so you're going to have, you know, structures, if it's a more interesting reading than just the description of the scene, you're going to have something that's going to say, you know, 
in this and, th- and therefore and then and so forth and you articulate you know a large structure and with this experience you articulate a large structure and so um, it's not just going to be you know an orienting remark but that I think is all consistent with the thought that ultimately I think Matthew was saying there were other things that were right. reasons just that there's also these things that right. are pretty clearly not reasons because they're imperatives Right, no, no, I agree. I, mean, I wasn't trying to change the fundamental shift. I just think we do flatten it a bit if we just make it seem like it's just, it's just orientation. Yeah. So um, I think it's your turn, regardless of how many fingers uh, crop up. I think up. there's probably been quite a bit of overlap now because I'm a bit interested in music. So, um, so then I, I think maybe, I think it's much clearer now, so maybe you could go through your example, like sort of a, kind of a kiss. Because I was puzzled by the tree of life and that's and Abby stuff. So. Um, so, right, we, uh, we're not articulating as we're watching. Uh, I judged as X to be beautiful. I were just with we feeling. And uh, both your cases are kind of artworks representing a lot of different kinds of feelings going on. Um, and then, all we need to what was part of this aesthetic feeling is that we could do reasons. I think you said you might not even be able to articulate them in one answer. But then I was thinking, well, the kind of reasons that you sort of what one does in criticism, you start to list how they work. And and I wonder then sometimes, well, when you go through that, you might, maybe only then is it really clear how one feels about something. I mean, it, these, I, I, I sort of worry that whatever it is I'm feeling <laughs> maybe or feel like isn't so clear to me um, and um, and that after having gone through this critique like is that am I then passing another aesthetic judgment is it another feeling that is occurring uh, after having given the reason because you're sort of saying this is something that should endure and it just I guess it doesn't quite fit far with the phenomenology engaging with uh, with artworks, for example. Right. That it has that. Yeah, it's good. So I think this is something I want to commit myself to. Um, if you do feel, oh wow, that's a great film, then this feeling is responsive to something, even if you have a hard time articulating it. And I think that we do all have a hard time articulating it, maybe because we are less experienced in talking about artworks, uh, <coughs> perhaps partly, um, perhaps partly because of the sort of singular nature of beauty that I mentioned before, that makes it really harder to um, learn through comparison and through experience. Um, not impossible, and that's how I think you become better and better in criticism at the end of the day, but at least harder. Um, so I think in cases in which you say, oh wow, it's a great film, you are responsive, again, to the to certain kinds of, okay, let's call them considerations for the time being, um, that you might be able to articulate better if you read a review. I often do that, actually. I just start to read review, and I think, oh, that fits what I thought. It doesn't fit what I thought. I thought definitely that. So, so reading more criticism can help maybe to articulate the kinds of considerations that your film is already responsive to. That's one case. And I think that um, if it is a proper aesthetic judgment, yeah, it has this... Um, self-maintaining nature, perhaps. Um, you might say, more colloquially, that it involves a certain kind of commitment. At least a commitment to go back to the film in the future and see that it, it, it indeed deserves this feeling that you felt for it. But I think that you are mentioning... You can kind of supply them if you're pressed, but... Um, yeah, but it doesn't mean that you're not already responsive to them. It just means that maybe you're not clear enough until you were asked to articulate them. Sometimes we just go out and uh, I think we are struck. I mean, that's part of the nature of 
beauty and, and artwork that they sort of struck us in important sense. Um, but I thought that you mentioned another, a, a slightly different case, a case in which you come out of the film and you're not sure if it's really a good film or not. You're not sure what you're filming. And that's, that's, I think, a slightly different case. I mean, it's basically you, your aesthetic judgment is not formed yet. You don't, you don't feel aesthetic pleasure yet. And you might come to feel it by yeah, endorsing certain considerations. So I don't know if there's a change of feeling. I mean, I don't, I'm not clear on exactly what's the starting point, but it seems that you haven't fully formed any kind of aesthetic judgment, partly because you haven't really judged it on the basis of sort of okay, so aesthetic that feeling. Part of my because I guess that a lot of times when I'm watching either Creole life or down to my I maybe then I'm, the way that I respond to the effort, I am actually not still passing aesthetic judgment. Mm -hmm. And that seems, that seems way too sort of cognitive to me, like that that's something that would only come into the picture after I start to articulate reasons and get really clear about what I'm really feeling. Oh, I see, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see that that's where you were going. Um, Do you think you do feel, from, I mean, clear? I mean, it seems to me that from what you're saying, that, I mean, um, I mean, I thought that you were just suggesting that it's actually less cognitive. I mean, I thought that you were, you're, you're pushing in the other direction, saying that, you know, there are very, very few cases in which, you know, we fail to conclusively theoretically judge that if there are objects around us, maybe if we travel, we go abroad, we are in a sort of unfamiliar um, environment. And you might also say that, you know, it's less common in practical judgments. We usually make up our mind about what to do. Although maybe not in my case. <laughs> but yes, so I thought that was the yeah. way you're going that that you're suggesting that sort of that there's a greater inconclusiveness in the aesthetic case that suggests that considerations or reasons work very differently here. I thought I thought that was this. Yeah, I just like wonder like if you, if on your model you think that you know you have an aesthetic judgment and then you sh you, know, you could give reasons, but then when you try you fail, and then you have to like, reassess your judgment. Or oh, that's yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I feel the way you're talking about this now, and the way this whole conversation is being structured, you, it, it feels to me like it's coming free of one of the main points of the paper about how you know what it is to experience all these beauty is not you know predicating a concept of it. I mean, think of a picture, and it, we have a non-aesthetic question of the picture. What does it represent? You know. Does it represent Mark's cup, or does it represent something else? So I think it's a picture of a cup. You say why, I give you reasons. Now the role of the reasons, the judgment that it's a cup, that's fixed. And now the reasons support the judgment. And then if the judgment's fixed, then all the reasons do is, as it were, give one reasons to go back and check and to support the judgment. Or, if you're not sure, then, you know, the reasons give you a reason to go back and look. And so, I'm uncertain whether it's a cup. Then, in that case, the reasons can change my experience. And I feel like we have the same model here, but now we're saying it's beautiful, rather than it's a cup. But, you know, if beauty works the way you said it does, and it seems to me that um, my experience of the thing as, you know, in the space of beauty suggests, you know, something that, you know, in principle could involve an infinite amount of articulation. And, and what the criticism is doing is not, you know, just, you know, giving reasons for that fixed experience is staying fixed. So you can now have that fixed experience of it as beautiful rather than cup. Rather, what the criticism does is continue to go back and allow me to explore its beauty that, you know, the criticism doesn't either have the role of confirming the judgment, but in no way altering the experience, or only altering the experience if I'm in a suspension, suspended state with respect to the question of whether it's 
beautiful. I mean, that seems to only fit if the judgment is something more like it's a cup. But it seems to me that what criticism does is precise, precisely, as it were, allow us to, as it were, um, enter the experience of beauty. You know, and you know, its articulation is itself, you know, part of the, um, as it were, exp- and the thought, the judgment that it's beautiful seems to be in the area of this is going to be worth, you know an infinity of time, you know, which the criticism itself allows me to. Now, there are particular cases, you know, we can talk about where someone just thinks the thing's really bad, you know, and so, and, and so, you know, like that disagreement. And so there the criticism is also just trying to, init, you know, literally initiate the experience um, of, of its being worth this kind of effort. But I, don't, but I think it's dangerous to take that threshold case as the model of, the relationship between criticism and judgment, or it starts looking like beautiful just is a, a determination of the thing. Good. Uh, so I, 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 I think I didn't mean it that way. I mean, I completely agree with you. I think that, yeah. It, it's, that it's just that you had these two cases, I judge as beautiful or I'm uncertain, and one is confirming, and the other is, like, suggesting transformation. It seems to me you want the transformation moment in there. I don't know if I used the, the, the term confirmation, but I did mean that it, it allows you to articulate it. Uh, definitely, definitely. That's, I mean, I think that's the point of criticism. I think that, that Kant does think that it's an infinite process, that you can always go back to the athlete. It's really beautiful. It will always strike you I mean, maybe... Well, it's just the infinite process is in the character of the experience, not just in how much there is to say once you had this momentary kind of fixed yeah. right. experience that then there's just it turns out to be an infinite amount to say about. But I saw it was beautiful. I saw it had this infinity. Now I just got a ton to say. God, I hope I have time to say it all. Right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's taking back... I agree. Object. What I meant to say, I mean, I meant to sort of maybe distinguish it from cases in which you really don't know what to think. You really, you're just, I mean, there are cases like that. You go out and you say, you know, at the end of it, I, I just really, I don't know. I don't know if I like it or not. Um, and so you are still in the, in the process of forming it. So there is a sense of, you know, being on the way, always with judgment, from the beginning of the judgment to say, from the very start. I think you're right. Yeah, but always. my thought was in both cases, both when you, in some sense, perceive it as beautiful, and when you don't, in both cases, the thing we were calling inducing considerations open up experience in both mm-hmm. cases. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the only opening up experience isn't something considerations only have to do in the threshold case of taking mm-hmm. from. Mm-hmm. It seems beautiful. Yeah, but we had um, Steve, Pascal, Go ahead. David. I was, I was a finger. Just, I, was I think these things have all claimed themselves to be fingers. So you. You're welcome to go back okay. if you want. Okay, so <laughs> Pascal and David and Arata, and then Arata's here. Okay. You had a hand a long time ago. That's yeah. Right. Well, we have some fingers. Pascal. Well, I had the finger on the previous discussion as well. Um, I'll say it anyway. Um, I was just going to say that I think there's less of a... Well, I don't know how much of a contrast was being implied in the discussion between the aesthetic case and the practical case. On the, on the issue of getting reasons and by, by saying, look at it like this. Um, but it seems to me that that's a very common feature of arguments about practical cases, that we um, decide like whether to do something or whether or what someone did was right by saying, look at it like this. Like if, if I'm, if I'm like deciding whether to help someone say, um, we can argue about whether that would count as like um, a condescending gesture or whether it would count as an act of like compassion um, and yeah so it just seems to me that very similar kinds of um, considerations are in play there and there's less of a contrast between the practical and the aesthetic uh, that I thought was perhaps the good um Um, so I agree that at least to some extent um, many kinds of practical judgment um, or practical arguments um, require also let's say um, an invitation to see 
the action in a certain way or or an effort to describe it in a certain way. Um, I think that's true. Um, I think that's partly why Kant, for example, thinks about actions in terms of maxims. So it's very important you know, when you consider what action is to be done that you give it an articulation that, 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 that you describe it in the right way, basically. Um, um, I think that's true. Um, but at least part of the difference here is that many times this consideration is not simply a consideration of the very sort of subtle detailed nuances of this specific action. But what you try to show is how this specific a action, because of its specific details, fits a certain kind of general description. Why it's compassion? To explain why it's compassion, you also need to describe compassion in the right way, for example, um, and the action in the right way. In the beauty case, again, there's no sort of general concept of beauty or general concept of a beautiful painting or a beautiful film that you can actually refer to in helping your interlocutor to be in the right place to see what you see. Um, so that's at least part of the difference there. Um, okay. but, but I take it that um, the cons it was uncontroversial, for example, that if the thing did look like a furniture advertisement or whatever, that would be that would that would not be a good thing. That would not count in favor of its beauty. Um, <laughs> so I, and well, and that's, that's, that's <laughs> again, it's non-independent of appreciation. Someone might tell you, "Oh, that's what makes it a great film." I mean, these advertisements are so aesthetically <laughs> novel and and refreshing. But, they, but presumably, they would have to say more about why they thought that. Like they would ha they would they would then place that in a broader context. Um, like maybe it's it's deliberately like this, and and that that is making some artistic point or something. Um, but we couldn't we couldn't just understand it without without a further um, general reason or like situating it in, in some further context as um, you know as as arbitrarily either counting in favor or against it you know depending on what what you happen to feel. I mean, and it seems like that similar in the practical case, like maybe maybe there are certain words that already that are so tied to approval that we that the words don't work like that. But it seems like many kinds of consideration um, could count in different contexts as either for or against um, some action, depending on what what we go on to say about about it. Yeah, and partly depending on what your end, for example, is, or, right, or, um, or what it is to be done, and that's missing from the aesthetic case. Even if you you do need to contextualize many of the reasons, or even if you need to, um, even if you um, refer to certain kind of comparisons, I mean, at the end of the day, it's not simply there is no general art there that you can look at at the end of the day basically the arbiter is your own appreciation so whether you see it or not that's, that's what will come again I think procedurally I'm going to suggest that we take two more fingers on this then close the second question <laughs> and, and go to the hands that have been waiting for a while so David and Michael will take two I more. think I'm a hand so I'm not a finger oh, okay well David um. I don't remember my original finger, but um, <laughs> I, mean, I, I think I'm picking up on something Irad said, and then that Irad said about the subject, and then maybe Jim said about the predicate when I say it's beautiful. So imagine that I've got a painting here. I'm looking at the front of it, and you only see the back of it. Right? Mm -hmm. And I say, that's beautiful. And you hear me say that. Now, 
I'm trying to figure out what the what the testimony. And I'm, you know that I'm really good at this kind of thing. And maybe I mm-hmm. even state some reasons. I say, well, you know, the, there's a kind of this harmony to the way the corners go, and there's these geometric shapes that are really subtly put. I say some stuff, painting stuff. Um, okay, you're you're. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm good at that. Even the past is not good. Good at aesthetic bullshit. Um, I squint my eyes. I get get on to the llama. Okay, I'll. I'll um, So, uh, so now, and and, you know, you have every reason to think I'm good at this kind of thing, right? I'm Michael Freed or some such person, right? But you don't see the painting. Okay, so now you're not entitled now, in some sense of entitled. You're not entitled to say that's a beautiful painting. That's the testimony. Um, but not entitled to make an aesthetic judgment. Yes, you're not entitled to make an aesthetic I, judgment. I might say, right. you know, it's a beautiful mm-hmm. painting because they be the expert. Right, right. right. You're not entitled to, to make an aesthetic judgment. And I express my belief. But that's a theoretical judgment. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Is the idea that even so you understand <laughs> what I said? But as I took it at Rod's point, was something like, you don't even know what I'm talking about yet. So there's a sense in which you don't know what I said. When I said, that's beautiful, you don't even know the subject. And I took it that in a certain sense, maybe a way to hear what Jim was saying is, you don't understand the, what I'm predicating. Maybe you understand the subject, but you don't, until you look at it, you don't, however much I talk about what happens when I squint my eyes, you don't know what the predication is. Right? Beauty, beautiful is just a kind of principle. So, so it's not that. Your problem is not that, well, there's this claim and you don't have... There's a certain kind of testimonial grounds that you have for perceptual claims that don't, you know, you're just, you, you lack justification of the sort that you would have in the perceptual case. Your problem is more, you don't know what I said yet. Well, it goes, I mean, it goes, both, yeah, I mean, it's so um, good. I mean, so the worry in the way you present it, and I'll say what's, what's the, the virtues of, of the way you present it are, too. But the worry is that, that that someone might think, oh, the only thing that is missing there, the entitlement, the justification, is my seeing it. Cause, because, you know, maybe I'm not entitled just because I haven't seen it, but when I see it, I'll be justified. I don't want that. So again, I don't think that aesthetic judgment is a, a belief and a feeling somehow conjunct conjoined together or something like that. I don't want that. So that's the worry about this kind of description. So it's not enough that I, you know, that I see it for, for myself um, to be entitled. I mean, in, in some sense, that that's not the, the distinction there. It's not that it's that I have the belief now, the only thing well, I need in addition is. is the the scene in see order it. to... It might be enough. But the eat have to be there. Yeah. Wait, so, 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 so that's one thing. It's more like it is. You just didn't see the movie. <laughs> so, I mean, so, 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 so the way I think about it, it's not, I mean... Um, So, my aesthetic judgment of it is going to have a completely different form than my expressing my belief that I find it beautiful. Okay, so it's going to be a, a completely different thing. Now, if you are an, an expert enough, if you are articulate <coughs> enough, then you will basically articulate your appreciation of the object in a way that takes into account whatever you see in the most detailed way. So your judgment, the, the one that I just hear, right, is not simply an expression of your belief, exactly, but it is a way of appreciating. The it's an expression of my pleasurable perceptual update. Yeah, but I'm just saying, you know, maybe there is a way of articulating in such a uh, articulating the all complex. It's like what you feel for it in a way that allows me at least to see something in there, not to be completely um, sort of not to know what, what, what the thing even is. I mean, if you articulate it in the right way. And then it could maybe be at least the basis for 
my belief that it's beautiful or even a basis for my wish to go and see it but it won't be an aesthetic judgment um, the basis for my belief that it's beautiful that's what it takes for granted that we've got a claim there it's beautiful and there's a question about whether it can be a basis or not but I'm, I'm wondering if, if your understanding my claim in the first place when I say I think I do I think either I do. the subject or the predicate. I think I do I think I do uh, I mean I, I, <coughs> sorry not that I do I'm sorry I mean I think I do I, I understand the worry um, and I see the worry um, um, yeah again I mean I I, I I think, it, I mean, I think maybe, I mean, there are cases in which I won't be able to know anything. I mean, just blah, 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 maybe, unless, you know, I see what I see. But in many cases, yeah, I can, I mean, if you are articulate enough, I can see sort of what you might be seeing there. If you, ex- I mean, if you articulate what you feel for it and the way your feeling is responsive to certain considerations. Um, I might be in a position to see how these considerations can lead to this feeling but it doesn't mean that I can appreciate the object independently of feeling the same thing myself I mean it might be at the end of the day that yeah I, I come to the, the, the painting and either I think oh you just didn't even describe no that's not the kind of I mean that's it's, it's a completely different thing you didn't even describe the thing clearly it's not a thing for me. But in that good case is what ha- I mean. So in that cu- good case, you understood my expression of aesthetic pleasure, let's say. Um, so you understood something about me. Mm-hmm. But I was also trying to. I mean, I was not just trying. I was saying something about the, the thing in front of me. It's beautiful. And I'm asking, did you also understand but what I said? But this feeling is not, again, I mean, so it's feeling that is always responsive, responsive to something. And if you can articulate what it is responsive to, if you can give me sort of a unified account of this whole thing, um, then perhaps I can be in a position to, to believe that there is this kind of thing that is to be felt disinterestedly. But it might be that I come to see it and I think, oh, you just, like, you missed the whole, I mean, it's not, I mean, it's not a landscape. It's, 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 it's you know, something else completely. I don't know, it's still life or something like that. Or I might say, oh, yeah, actually, I see now it is a landscape, but, or it is a performance, but because, as I said before, because it's so precise, not great. It's just mechanical. So, I mean, I, there, there should be, I mean, I, I think there could be different scenarios. And I think that if the critic is articulate enough, um, you should be capable of seeing something. Of, of seeing? Of seeing something. Of seeing. Okay. I think we should go to our third yeah. hand. <laughs> I'll, I'll make this very brief because we're running out of time. Um, this is just um, about a general worry about certain identities you have in your paper. Um, and um, uh, let me put it this way: um, What faculty exactly is the our imperative? Like, um, look at it this way, um, or address to, or what faculty really is responsive to um, aesthetic reason? Is it the feeling of pleasure or the power of reflective judgment? That's Because okay. um, I would have thought it is the power of reflective judgment. You seem to suggest that it is the... I'm, I'm trying to suggest that you can separate them that way. So, I mean, at the end of the day, it's not a pleasure itself. <coughs> but Indepen- it's not a pleasure itself independently of the power of judgment. So... So if Kant is right, the determining ground of the pleasure is the harmony of the faculty. That's, that's exactly what it's conscious of. Right? That's, what it, that, that's, 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 that's how it's conscious of its ground, namely how it's conscious of itself as proper in the right way to the object. So, um, yeah, so at the end of the day, 
you would like to identify those two? I, I, I want to say that the, we, 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 I mean, we can abstract, we can think about them abstractly, but as Kant thinks about them, they're not two separate stages of aesthetic judgment. Um, there's an act of judgment. There's no first harmony of the faculties and then pleasure, or first pleasure and then harmony of the, pl- of the faculties. There is a pleasure that is grounded in the harmony of the faculties, and because of that, in the those needn't to be different stages in any way, temporally or <coughs> causally. They might be logically different, nevertheless, and I do not really see that Kant could commit himself to identify the power of judgment or the power of reflective judgment with the pleasure, the feeling of pleasure in, in any robust sense, since um, one is a faculty or is subordinated to the faculty of knowledge, and the other is yeah. Opposed. So yeah, okay. Different. I mean, okay. So I mean, he does claim that you know it's, it's, it's the power of the, of the judgment determines the faculty of pleasure and displeasure. So he basically actually mm-hmm. he, 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 he at least draws an analogy between. Not the, only yeah. that. I mean, that's one of its functions. Definitely. Among ma- many others. Yeah. So yeah. At least and I want that to be right. So I mean, so the, the determining ground is the power. of Judgment. It's not aesthetic pleasure in isolation. I mean, so if we just if logically abstract between the two, mm-hmm. I think that's right. But we, it's important not to distinguish between them, sort of empirically. As, as mm-hmm. but, 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 but an engagement in reflection is still different from the consciousness of this engagement of in reflection and he you correctly identifies the feeling of pleasure in this case with the consciousness of the reflection but not with the reflection itself so I think there is room to I mean but again this doesn't amount to say okay there's first this and then it's this or something like that but there is an important difference to be made here I think and I'm afraid that and, and I agree I mean I agree what's okay. responsible for Basically, the spontaneous nature of aesthetic judgment mm-hmm. is the power of judgment. Um, but it's very important for him to say that the power of judgment can determine the pleasure a priori. It's not an empirical judgment. Uh, it is an empirical pleasure. judgment. It's explicitly about that. I, I didn't say it's not an empirical judgment. In some sense, he wants to say in the first introduction that in some sense it's not determined, that the aesthetic pleasure is not determined empirically. It could no, be it determined is not, but it is a, a priori. Judgment. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, and um, and he does call it a pleasure of reflection. I mean, that's one of the, his main yeah, but this main could description be an of the pleasure. It could be an objective um, genitive and mm. to be read as a subjective genitive. Okay. So I. It talks about pleasure of reflection. But I I, I agree. It's just, I mean, the power of judgment is the, the power of reflection itself. Um, no just a, a footnote on this. I mean, isn't I, I sort of I think in support of Johannes's um, concern. I mean, isn't isn't there um, um, a place in, in um, the account? Of, wouldn't you want to have place for this too? Uh, for reflection without yet the accompaniment of pleasure. One's contemplating the object, considering it, and in the course of the reflection, one comes to feel the pleasure of appreciation of the beauty of, of the object, um, and the the, the 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 separation of those two moments that, that needn't follow. Well, you know, one's 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 engaged in the object, and it may turn out not to be beautiful, um, but in the happy case, it 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 it, it does, and um, that's you know. Appreciated through the um, through the pleasure that arises in the reflection, and that's the conscious of the harmony of the faculties in the reflecting. But there needn't be the harmony there um, from the from the moment one begins to reflect. I, mean, Kant, I think uses speaks of reflection in a way that is open to its. You know, it's, it's a it's a it's like a trying. It's 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 a it's or it's attending, um, and so. What do you, so I'd be worried about this picture 
um, it's, it's, um, it seems very close to sort of Geyer's. Um, sort of oh, I, no, I don't think I'm anywhere near Geyer, oh, but... Picture. Um, so, I mean, I... <laughs> we can all accept as a criteria. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I definitely don't want the reflection on how many of the faculties to be sort of the efficient cause. No, I wasn't saying measure. that, but there's yeah. a separation that mm-hmm. can be reflecting without the pleasure. Would you do you accept that? So I think that what's going on. I mean, there are a few things. I mean, there is a form of reflection of the power of judgment in what he calls logical reflective judgment. We didn't even touch right. that. Right. And I think the somewhat different story. And there, there is a reflection that is independent of pleasure that makes it significantly different from aesthetic judgment in a way that I think oh, requires I see, I see. explanation. I think that in an aesthetic judgment, um, uh, the judgment itself, again, I mean, it's not that we cannot logically abstract them and explain them theoretically in a philosophical, philosophical reflection. I think that, that the, the reflection always goes hand in hand with feeling. It would be either a feeling of pleasure or a feeling of displeasure, although I, I don't want to get to the sort of complicated... Well, I, I, actually, I agree with that, too, but um, the specific feeling of pleasure needn't be always present in the reflecting. That was what I mean. So it's either a feeling of pleasure some or a feeling of pleasure. There will always be some aspect of gefühl. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'm, I'm there with you. But the pleasure of aesthetic, of, of appreciation of beauty needn't be there. That was the thought. I agree. In sort of a, an attitude of aesthetic consideration. Yeah, yeah. Preparation exactly, exactly, for. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But again, it's, it's, there is gefühl there. Oh, yes. I mean, it's, yeah. otherwise yeah. it's not. Yeah. It's not That's aesthetic fault. judgment. Yeah. Michael Williams has been waiting about an hour with a hand. I think we should watch this. No, well, this might just be completely off base, but um, making such a thing about beauty, at least looking now by back to the 20th century, seems an incredible restriction of this, of even our critical vocabulary. I mean, never mind when we think of non-visual arts. And it relates to David's worry about if there's really no specific conceptual content for the notion of beauty, then all you really seem to hear when he says, oh, my, my God, you know, it's <coughs> painting, you've just learned something about him. I mean, if there's no, there's no, there's no transmissible content, you've learned, learned nothing about the painting except its power to evoke a certain response in David, which is not really to learn much about it as, a, as, as an object. Um, but it just seems to me that lots of paintings that have a great effect on you, you'd be deeply reluctant to call them beautiful at all. I mean, I was looking at Goya's black paintings in the... Guernica. <laughs> at, at the, at the, in the Prado. Um, there's this wonderful painting called Drowning Dark, which could almost be a Rothko, because it's just these two color fields, very painterly color fields, they're not flat. Um, of ochre and then a, a red slanted band over the bottom except there's this tiny head of what might very well be a dining canine and it's this incredible representation I think of somehow finitude, mortality utter helplessness is it beautiful? I don't know, it's disturbing <laughs> I mean, along with several other paintings there but it seems to me there's got to be a judgment of beauty has to be a very specific has to be a specific mode of aesthetic judgment it can't in any way exhaust one's art critical vocabulary and, and I, I think Kant's um, account as, 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 as you describe it is in danger of just tacking the word beauty um, as somehow the universal word of aesthetic approval and I simply don't see how that can be so. I mean, it, it, you know, the first time you hear, I don't know, Don Giovanni or something, you know, you might, and, and, and you hear Ottavio sing Dalla Sua Pace, you think it's ravishing. The first time you hear Strauss's Electra, I'm not so sure, you know. I mean, 
<laughs> you might be you might you might be very affected by it, but not in the same way as 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 as, as Mozart. And I I just wanted that this emphasis on beauty is somehow flattening the critical vocabulary in a way that it perhaps ties it to a certain kind of classicism, which you know, the sort of thing that made the French not like Shakespeare or something, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> because, because he mixes he mixes genres and, 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 and the classical unities are not observed and, and, and there's a beauty to the verse of Racine which there there isn't to the ravings of King Lear or something. But then you think too bad for the French, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know right. I mean that was their problem, not Shakespeare's problem. And it wouldn't be Goya's problem if you found some of the horror represented um, by him in a way almost repellent to be, that, that it would be wrong to aestheticize it under the category of beauty the painting would fail if it did that um, so I'm really bothered about making beauty the be all and end all of aesthetic judgment anyway it's, I know that's not terribly relevant to no, your particular interpretation yeah. of Kant but it's something that's been bothering me throughout this whole discussion one just short remark before I, I actually answer your, okay. your question just a remark about it again. I just, I mean, part of the actually my worry about the scenario was that um, the aesthetic judgment would appear to be um, ineffable and incommunicable. Yeah. And that's not what Kant thinks. I mean, it's, 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 it has a special form of communicability, but it's communicable. That's really what's really important about it. I was really afraid also that it would suggest that it is a judgment about his feeling. That's something that's kind of. No, I didn't mean that. I meant yeah, it was yeah. all you so would just, learn just, from just it. Not, remark, not, not the it's judgment just itself, just but it's by such shareability, the most you could learn from him was the prior to it. Sure. It's more from what you learn is he says it, the saying, rather than what is said, because the, the community that we've said is the, is the issue. Right. I wasn't, and then, just very clearly, I wasn't even meaning to suggest anything about incommunicability. If you come around, yeah. then. Yeah, yeah, right. Thing, it's fine, perfectly communicable. This is not. Yeah, but not by testimony, David. Right? Yeah, just not by testimony. You know, so like if I if I'm on the phone with you and I say <laughs> that's big, that's also you don't know what the hell I'm talking about. You know, it doesn't mean that there's anything in principle. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, beauty. Um, maybe not in this paper, in some paper. I, I think uh, usually when when I start to go on conscious ethics, I, I I often have some kind of footnote trying to um, explain the way I use beauty following him and why it's not meant to be um, um, it doesn't mean it, 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 it's not meant to exclude um, conceptual artworks etc 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 I mean it can philosophize in a certain tradition of thinking about art and beauty um, uh, um, and, and, and I do think I don't know that I have enough time but I think it, there's a lot of wor I mean there's there are resources to show why the way he used beauty does not exclude you know many of the artworks that he couldn't even imagine actually and why his account is fitting for artworks that are not beautiful in the narrow sense of the world, um, the word, or, um, or conceptual artworks even, um, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm, I'm not going to get into it. Partly, I think I, uh, what I'm going to say is that I also, I mean, it's not simply, I mean, it's not that I want to say, well, you know, you, you philosophize in a certain tradition, and I work on him, so I use the term beauty. I think there is important, there is significance. It's important to preserve this um, term, just as I think it's very important to preserve this, the concept of good when we, take, when we talk about practical rationality, and it is important to preserve the, the, the concept of truth when it comes to theoretical rationality, and I do think that the, the, the three are analogous in, in, in very important respects, and so, um, so, so, so part of the way that I think Kant uses the term beauty is to um, suggest a certain manner of relating to objects. Basically, it's a, I think that beauty is a formal object of aesthetic judgment, so it actually stands for this specific power of judgment. 
rather than to any sort of empirical description of uh, um, a certain set of objects. And so that's why at the end of the day, even if there are many artwork, artworks today that might be great, but are not beautiful in the narrow sense of the word, I would like to, to preserve, um, preserve the notion. Yeah, I mean, one of the things you might wonder though is how so, how, suppose something failed to be beautiful. I mean, what would sort of be the, so to say, the contraries? I mean, you might think, well, ugly, <laughs> this is what obvious, but, but I mean, there's sure there's many ways one could fail to be beautiful, beautiful without being, going all the way to being, something that might be merely pretty, for example, or decorative, or, or Matt's friend with, think about the ads. I think he's inviting you to think of the film as in a way false or kitsch perhaps so you know that the, what you took for beauty was just kitsch yeah. a kind of manipulation of familiar image styles from uh, it, it, it seems just too it's not fine grained enough to me this, this idea of, the, of I, I would have thought I mean I, right, it's, I, it's just a complaint I mean I just you're not going to like what I say about truth by the way Karen was putting you know the point like Kant's notion of beauty does not exclude you know well, but to put it a little more strongly I mean there's a question about whether Kant's aesthetics is going to be equal to something like Goya I don't think anything I'm saying settles that but I would have thought the virtue of the way Kant thinks about aesthetics from the point of view of what you were saying is that if you have a conception of aesthetics in which what a word like beauty names is certain qualities of objects then it seems like whatever term we have that names the qualities of the objects you know that functions determinatively in that way, it's not going to be able to do justice, you know, to Strauss and Goya and so forth. And, and Kant is looking for something. We can leave aside the work, you know, let's just call it Blick for a minute, but he's looking for something that stands to aesthetic judgment as good stands to practical judgment and true stands to theoretical judgment. So the notion is, in that sense, formal, an experience that can support you know, attention of a certain kind of form is going to is is going to formally have that character. Now, it is true that the word beauty is often employed as if it were you know a material concept in that way, and then you could think that was an important choice. Yeah, that's not, There's other questions one can raise. That's about not good this. enough because this goes back to Mark's point, I think, in that. There's a mode of appreciation which is essentially first personal in the way that observatives are, and that's the that's the one of the key formal aspects. But whether that mode of appreciation is associated, so to say, with a single final category of judgment that that represents the positive outcome of that mode of appreciation is an entirely separate question, it seems to me. And just sticking the word beauty on something that has a distinctively first personal aspect formally is an impoverishment of critical capitalism. They're just saying read as beauty as aesthetically good. Yeah, but that's no good. That's what I'm resisting. Well, it's, it's a t- definition. I mean, you, you can't resist it if they just want to stipulate that's what they mean by beauty. And then, but, but what does follow is that I take it there's an incredible variety in what that feeling is that's playing a role here, right? I mean, it's not a name of beauty. is not the name of the particular feeling because the feeling can be I don't think you can stipulate that because not, it's not as if the word has no existing, so to say, you know, associations and inferential suggestions. It's not just I can I think call it blur. Michael, it. <laughs> Michael's yeah. skepticism is about whether there is such a thing as the form of aesthetic. Right. Yes. yes. Right. If, if there is, then right. okay, you can yeah. you can introduce right. whatever word you like. Right. It's the name of the form of object. Of yeah. Why yeah. should there be? Um, right. Uh, wouldn't that be a way of getting at it? That would be a way of getting at it. But I didn't think your example showed that there wasn't a common form in her sense. It just said that there were different uh, kind of specific emotional engagements. What I see, well, well, you said they what I see in common is the essentially first personal aspect is that you must be engaged with the object. I do see that. And, um, and, I, and one could perhaps push it further than that. There might be certain formal features of the object, which not of course consciously, but That's nevertheless one also engages with. Uh, but nevertheless, the idea of introducing, even stipulatively, a single term for, so to say, a positive feeling at the end of it all strikes me as not necessarily a good idea. And we are going to let Michael have the last word. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
I want to ask you something. I, I agree. But I, I agree with everything you said. Yeah. It's a piece of junk. Yeah. It's a piece of junk.